We're going to start the final session now. And so the, the final guest who's speaking is Roger Kornberg, who's a professor of structural biology at Stanford Medical School. And I think most of you know Roger comes from a distinguished scientific family, but has made many important contributions uh, on his own. In fact, in back-to-back -back papers in 1974, he announced the discovery of the nucleosome, which he heard about earlier today. And that work was done with Francis Crick and Aaron Klug uh, in the same laboratory where Sid began his work on, on tRNA. And in his own laboratory, Roger has done obviously very important work looking at the structure of the transcriptional apparatus and in particular solving that structure to the atomic resolution of RNA polymerase II transcribing DNA into messenger RNA, a fundamental process in biology. So it's a terrific to uh, welcome him. He won the Nobel Prize in 2006 for this work, and it's great to be, for him to be the final speaker at today's symposium. So uh, thank you, Dan, and uh, let me add a, to what others have said, what a privilege and pleasure it is uh, to congratulate you, Sid, to participate in this celebration of your work. Um, unlike the others who were either a teacher or a fellow student or ultimately uh, a student of yours, uh, I represent the rest of the world, um, <laughs> all of the many additional gr admirers of your work. Uh, <clears throat> I will, uh, in the brief time that is available, uh, speak primarily about uh, two subjects. I'll begin with an introduction showing you just a view of the RNA polymerase II pre-initiation complex, and this is the work of Kenji Murakami, Nir Kalisman, David Bushnell, and then a former postdoctoral fellow who's been at Scripps for many years, Francisco Asturias, and his <coughs> postdoctoral fellow, Kwong Lee Tsai. Um, I'll spend most of the time after that introduction uh, speaking about the transcription of chromatin, and all of this work is due to Shigeki Nagai. If time permits, I'll comment briefly on a point that Mark Patashny raised, um, and in this respect, work done by Yali Lorch and Barbara Mayer Davis, and then I hope to leave time at the end for a second subject. Uh, and that is the folding of chromatin fibers beyond the level of the nucleosome, uh, in this case the work of Kyle Egan and Tom Hartle. Now as I mentioned, and you heard from Dan and you're all doubtless aware, um, all that I tell you relates to transcription by one of the three polymerases of eukaryotic cells, RNA polymerase II. And uh, many of you are doubtless aware of what my, Mark uh, diagrammed in one of his slides namely the components of the polymerase II transcription machinery, which we and others identified by now some 30 years ago. Uh, the polymerase itself is capable alone of unwinding the DNA double helix and of RNA synthesis, but alone unable to recognize a start site and initiate the process of transcription. And it is for those essential functions that it requires the so-called general transcription factors uh, that go by the letter names B, D, E, F, and H. Now, it was a thought for some time that this constellation of proteins is not only sufficient uh, for the initiation of transcription, for promoter-dependent transcription, but sufficient also for a response to regulatory influences. And indeed, um, as Mark would attest if he were here, uh, it was, there were many proofs of that point of direct interaction of transcriptional activator proteins with <coughs> components of this machinery published during the 1980s. Nevertheless, in the early 90s, my colleagues uh, Kelleher, Flanagan, Kim, and Bjorklund discovered an additional component required for an influence of a transcriptional activator protein, such as Mark mentioned, upon the transcription machinery that I have just described. Uh, this, they isolated uh, from yeast as a 21 protein uh, million molecular weight complex. Uh, we now know that it is conserved throughout eukaryotes. Uh, we refer to it as mediator for the obvious reason that it goes between regulatory molecules, both activators and repressors, and the transcription machinery. And we now know 
that some 60 proteins assemble in a large complex of about 3 million Daltons at every RNA polymerase II promoter prior to every round of transcription. To understand the mechanism of the machinery, uh, we began long ago to investigate its structure, and we started, as you will have heard, with the polymerase itself an assembly of a dozen subunits with a mass greater than half a million Daltons and far larger than could even be uh, solved at the time when we started, but the process, when it finally culminated uh, after about 15 years, led, as you've heard, to the structure of the polymerase in the act of transcription with both gene DNA and product RNA associated at near atomic resolution. Another 15 years later, uh, we finally succeeded in assembling the entire complex of polymerase with all of the general factors, uh, an assembly of, uh, in the form that we studied, about one and a half megadaltons, and just last year could report the uh, structure determined by cryo-electron microscopy, um, as shown in this slide. So what you see here um, is, first of all, a space-filling model, so an envelope of the entire structure of this 33-protein complex uh, as determined by cryo-electron microscopy. And then superimposed on that uh, envelope are the crystal structures of the polymerase in gray of the general transcription factors B, which is red, the crystal structure of the Tata box binding uh, subunit of factor D, which is green, uh, factor E in pink, factor F in blue, and a, the portion of factor H for which crystal structures have been determined uh, superimposed as well. And you see that there's really a very impressive near perfect fit of the crystal structure of polymerase and of the other crystal structures to the map. Uh, in addition, one sees the DNA, uh, and at this resolution, the major and minor grooves of the DNA in, uh, even resolve. And what I'll show you in the next picture is a view down the axis of the DNA double helix. So we rotate this around. You view down the axis of the DNA double helix. And this picture, also superimposed, um, is just one of the crystal structures. That of the uh, ATP-dependent DNA helicase subunit of factor H, which is responsible for unwinding the double helix to bring about the initiation of transcription. Uh, the notable feature of this picture <coughs> is the lack of any interaction of polymerase with the DNA in a polymerase pre-initiation complex. Indeed, the DNA is associated only with the general factors, and uh, if there were time, I would explain why that is, and in more detail the significance, but I'd like to go on. If there were time, I would also show you uh, a cryo-EM picture of not only uh, polymerase and the general factors, but also mediator. Um, but rather what I'd like to do is explain in the time I have this afternoon um, why this picture, even that of the polymerase, general factors, and mediator is incomplete. And the assembly of proteins responsible for the initiation of transcription of all genes transcribed by polymerase to is a good deal larger, more complex, and uh, I think more interesting. <coughs> now the reason uh, why the structure proves to be much more complicated than we realized is because of a mistaken assumption that we and others have made over the years. Uh, we always thought that the template for assembly of this complex and for transcription is a naked DNA molecule, and there was good reason to believe so. Uh, I mean, uh, in the first place, um, I think it's obvious that the DNA can't be at the same time surrounded, as you see here, by all of the components of the pre-initiation complex, and at the same time wrapped around a set of eight histone molecules in a nucleosome. Uh, Yali Lorch and I had shown in 1987 that wrapping promoter DNA around histones in the nucleosome prevents the initiation of transcription in vitro. And Michael Grunstein and colleagues showed the very next year a similar inhibitory effect of histones upon the initiation of transcription in yeast cells in vivo, on which basis we, uh, Mike Grunstein and others, came to believe what you heard Mark say earlier, the nucleosome serves as a general gene repressor. 
It prevents expression of all the many thousands of genes in eukaryotes except those whose expression is brought about by specific positive regulatory mechanisms. Again, it would seem apparent that any such mechanism must entail at some stage <clears throat> the removal of histones of the disruption of the nucleosome. Uh, in fact, the late Ira Hershkowitz, a great yeast, yeast geneticist who uh, died a, unfortunately at a, uh, on a, at a at a unfortunate early age, uh, the, Ira Hershkowitz had uh, intuited the existence of the proteins responsible for removing histones to allow transcription. Um, from genetic studies in yeast, he uh, concluded or he deduced the existence of a so-called switch sniff complex. <coughs> Mark also mentioned it in his lecture. Uh, he identified five genes which he believed would comprise that, would, would compose that complex and which would be responsible for relieving the inhibition of transcription by histones. When uh, some years later, my colleagues and I isolated the switch sniff complex from yeast, we could verify his hypothesis. We discovered it contained a number of additional proteins, one of which, so-called SWAP73, uh, we knew had a homolog in the yeast genome, and then pursuit of that homolog revealed another even larger assembly of proteins, uh, which, like switch sniff, serves as a chromatin remodeling complex um, and plays a role in removing histones for transcription. The switch sniff complex is, in fact, uh, relatively scarce, only about 100 molecules in a yeast cell, and the genes for switch sniff proteins can be deleted without a, uh, effect upon vegetative growth. By contrast, the risk chromatin remodeling complex is abundant uh, on the order of 1,000 molecules per cell, and the genes that encode it are essential for cell growth. Uh, we uh, discovered over the years that followed uh, two important bio uh, chromatin remodeling activities of the risk complex. Risk in the presence of ATP will slide histone optimers and then that way expose a site for interaction with a protein molecule. Um, risk in the presence of ATP and a histone chaperone will actually dislodge the histones from DNA and expose uh, a region of the DNA in that manner. We wanted uh, to find out to determine whether what I have told you is the whole story. Um, so is it true, in fact, that uh, risk enables the uh, initiation of transcription by the PAL2 transcription machinery? We wanted to recapitulate the process starting from chromatin and culminating in transcription with purified proteins in a cell-free system. Now, others uh, in the years gone by have performed experiments along these lines. They uh, produced chromatin by uh, the addition of purified histones to template DNA or with the use of extracts from cells that would serve as chromatin assembly systems. Uh, we thought it was important uh, to pursue the problem with the use of chromatin assembled not in vitro in that manner, but as it is formed in cells in vivo. Uh, after all, we uh, could not know, uh, it has not yet been determined, what is the precise pattern of post-translational modifications of the histones of nucleosomes associated with a promoter. Um, it, is, uh, it was not known uh, what additional non-histone proteins might play a role. Uh, and so with the purpose of investigating as a template for transcription, chromatin uh, isolated from nature, uh, we uh, performed the procedure illustrated in, the, uh, in this slide. So we began uh, following a protocol invented by Mark Gartenberg here at Yale, inserting uh, sites for recognition by a recombinase uh, either side of a gene. And for these studies, we studied the full five gene of yeast, though as I'll tell you, the results are completely general. Uh, then by expression of the recombinase in the yeast cells in vivo, uh, one brings about the excision of the gene, in this case full five, in the form of a circle um, still associated with the natural set of chromosomal proteins. The circle could be isolated by affinity means. We purified it to some 200,000 fold to virtual homogeneity. Uh, when uh, Shigeki Nagai set about 
uh, transcription with polymerase and the general factors, uh, he found, as we expected, no detectable transcription from the gene isolated in the repressed form as chromatin. Uh, the same DNA extracted from the chromatin would, of course, give, give rise to measurable transcription. I, I should say that um, an experiment like this, which Nagai performed, was not straightforward because of the extraordinarily small quantity of material. We're isolating chromatin from single copy genes, means we recover atomolar, that is 10 to the minus 18th molar quantities of chromatin, and detection of transcription was a challenge, but which he nevertheless overcame. Shigeki then found that by the addition of five more proteins, the activator protein for the FO5 gene, called FO4, uh, TF2S, which was previously regarded as a transcription elongation factor, but we find is essential for initiation, the mediator that I've mentioned, another complex to which Mark alluded, the Saga complex, and a remodeling uh, protein complex, which could be either SWITCHNIP or RISC in these experiments, now, uh, in the presence of that group of proteins, uh, the chromatin template was efficiently transcribed. In fact, to our surprise, to a far greater extent than naked DNA extracted from the chromatin circle. Uh, we had thought if we were ultimately successful, we would achieve a level of transcription from chromatin comparable to that from a naked molecule. But to our astonishment, the level of transcription from chromatin was far greater. And in fact, as the concentration of polymerase in the general factors and other proteins was reduced, the ratio of transcription from chromatin to that from the naked DNA molecule increased to the point where uh, it was at least 20-fold greater at the lowest concentration that we were able to use. So this would indicate uh, that chromatin is better able to recruit um, so it shows a higher affinity for the proteins involved in transcription than a naked DNA molecule, which is a point I'll return to in a moment. I might mention in passing that chromatin transcription requires acetyl-CoA. Uh, of course, naked DNA transcription does not. And also, chromatin transcription requires a subunit of the Saga complex called SGF29. So a form of Saga deleted for that complex shows significantly diminished transcription uh, from the chromatin template. So just to uh, summarize what I've told you to this point, uh, transcription from chromatin is a good deal greater than that from a naked DNA molecule, and it increases relative to that from naked DNA as the concentration of the transcription proteins uh, decreases, uh, which points to an interaction of chromatin, and in particular, as I'll show you, the nucleosome uh, with the transcription machinery. And then I just mentioned that uh, that interaction involves both histone acetylation and the histone 3K4 trimethylamar uh, that is recognized by a subunit of the Saga complex. Now, we could identify which nucleosome of the chromatin template is involved in this interaction uh, by virtue of studies done many years ago by Wolfram Hertz and colleagues. So Hertz had shown that the FO5 gene, as you might imagine, and as Mark illustrated in his diagrams, is packaged in an array of nucleosomes in the repressed state. Uh, Hertz also showed that upon transcriptional activation, so upon induction of transcription of the FO5 gene in yeast in vivo, two nucleosomes are removed, and one is caused to slide. It shifts in position, exposing the Tata box of the promoter but still covering the transcription start site. Now, we could insert the sites for recognition by the recombinase to make chromatin circles upstream and downstream of the promoter, and in that way, isolate circles from the gene in the repressed state that would bear three nucleosomes, circles from the gene in the activated state bearing only a single <coughs> nucleosome located over the transcription start site, but exposing the Tata box. We found still there was enhanced transcription from the chromatin template compared with the naked DNA molecule. On this basis, then, we believe, contrary to what we had imagined, that uh, the presence of a nucleosome covering the transcription start side would be inhibitory to transcription. Rather, that the nucleosome covering the start site, commonly referred to as the plus one nucleosome, is actually a component of the transcription machinery.
Uh, we imagine uh, that the transcription machinery we previously thought comprised polymerase, the general factors, and mediator uh, now entails assembly of a much larger complex uh, beyond those 67 protein, uh, 57 proteins, a total of 99, a complex of over 5 million dolphins, uh, again, which must be formed at every polymerase 2 promoter prior to the initiation of transcription. Now, I said what we have observed for the FOF5 gene of yeast we believe to be general. We think it's applicable to all yeast genes, in fact, to all genes of eukaryotes, and I'll explain now briefly why. So this picture, which I have just shown you, of a single nucleosome in the activated state covering the transcription start site, flanking an exposed region, is observed throughout the yeast genome. So you see a picture here of a type of analysis that has been reported by uh, many research groups. This is our own version of the same thing. It's obtained by mapping the locations of nucleosomes um, with the use of uh, cleavage between them by micrococcal nuclease and then deep sequencing. Uh, what you see plotted in red is the likelihood of, of occurrence of a nucleosome as a function of position along a 100 kb region of one of the yeast chromosomes. And also indicated below are the locations of transcribed regions with the start sites by the plus signs. If we zoom in on one portion, what you see what is uh, through throughout the genome, namely uh, an array of nucleosomes, uh, but with the apparent absence of one uh, immediately upstream of a transcription start site, um, and then a very well positioned nucleosome, uh, the so-called plus one nucleosome, covering that site. The so-called free or nucleosome free region includes the Tata box and regulatory elements, um, and those are available for interaction with activator or repressor proteins and uh, for the beginning of assembly of the transcription machinery. Um, in the interest of time, I won't uh, comment on the question that is posed here of what is the basis of the NFR, but I'll skip directly uh, to uh, a further uh, and last topic of my presentation. Uh, I'll simply summarize what uh, I've told you up to this point in the following way. We think what emerges is what I might call a two-step authentication mechanism for the turn-on of transcription. Uh, a first step in which uh, a region that includes regulatory elements in the Tata box is exposed, but still leaving a nucleosome covering the start site. And then a second step that requires that nucleosome and culminates in the initiation of transcription. Um, it's rather like the immune system that requires two steps to assure fidelity of the response. In this case, two steps uh, and an intermediate in which a nucleosome still covering a start site prevents adventitious initiation of transcription. Uh, now, everything I've told you to this point relates uh, to chromatin chromatin at the only level we presently understand, namely an array of nucleosomes, uh, which, uh, in, as I've said, in the repressed state, and as Mark emphasized as well, uh, more or less uniformly packages the genomic DNA. Uh, the next slide will, uh, in a way, summarize our ignorance of the problem. So this is a picture many of you will have seen, uh, an electron microscope thin section of a eukaryotic nucleus uh, with heterochromatin, the condensed region around the periphery, so-called euchromatin in the interior. I showed this picture for 20, 25 years uh, to uh, medical students at Stanford when I taught histology to medical students. And then finally, uh, the Stanford administration, in its wisdom, eliminated basic science from the medical curriculum. And so uh, I don't have many opportunities of showing it again. <laughs> I do so now uh, for a particular reason, which is, uh, uh, to call attention to the question of what is the organization of chromosomal material, in particular, what is the structure of a gene um, in interphase in a eukaryotic cell nucleus. Uh, now, I will tell you then only briefly about experiments which I think shed light on this question, and they come from our use of a method introduced by others that you heard mentioned, um, chromosome confirmation capture, or in its most elaborate form, so-called high c And the method is, is very straightforward. It involves fixation with formaldehyde to cross-link proteins. 
uh, cleavage of the DNA, uh, and then finally ligation of the cut ends if the proteins have brought together two regions located at distant sites in the genome, sequencing across the junction will, will reveal their proximity in the chromosome. And this has been done, as I say, by um, many others over the years, and this is just an example uh, from work by Decker and colleagues of the results that are obtained. Um, what you see here, each red dot that is plotted here um, corresponds to uh, a point of a, a cross-linking. Uh, so of approximation between uh, a location in the DNA sequence of the chromosome plotted here and another location in the same chromosome plotted on the other axis. And what is revealed by this type of analysis done in many laboratories are the, this is such an alternation of regions of intrachromosomal interaction and uh, less such <laughs> intrachromosomal contact. It struck me. Um, such an alternation of interaction and absence of such uh, was reminiscent of polyphene chromosomes of Drosophila. And so we asked the question whether uh, the application of high C to uh, dipteran larval tissue containing polyphene chromosomes would produce a similar result to what you saw in the previous slide. Kai Ligon found, indeed, uh, the uh, so-called topologically associating domains, or TADs, uh, could be detected when the procedure was applied to salivary gland tissue of uh, the appropriate larval stage of Drosophila. And then what you see in the next slide um, is in the number of cases where DNA sequence coordinates of bands are known. And in these cases, though the, the DNA of the bands is lined up at the left side. Um, the amount of DNA in a band varies in length. And what you see in red is the overlap with a TAD revealed by the high C approach with the DNA sequence coordinates of the band. In black are regions of non-overlap. Well, it's obvious that there's almost a perfect correspondence of uh, TADs with bands. Uh, the same thing could be applied, so bands equal TADs, and I might add what this immediately uh, reveals is something significant about the interpretation of a TAD. People had wondered, are these uh, transient, or do they represent stable interactions? Uh, do they relate to regulation, or do they relate to structure? What we learn uh, from this simple uh, observation, uh, TADs actually correspond uh, to regions of persistent chromosomal condensation along the length of the chromosome. We could apply the same procedure, and it's plotted in a similar manner, to uh, the <coughs> so-called high c or chromosome conformation capture analysis of diploid cells. And what emerges is that not only are bands equivalent to polyteen TADs, uh, but they're nearly the same as diploid TADs, from which it emerges that the picture of a chromosome that one observes uh, in the light microscope uh, from examination of polyteen tissue actually reveals the organization of the chromosomal material in the interphase nucleus of, well, in this case, uh, cultured cells of Drosophila, but virtually the same result with uh, embryonic tissue of Drosophila you containing. Mean, like the Absolutely. You see exactly the same result. The same. Sorry? On the contrary, the band pattern, which oh, yeah. is characteristic, so is that you make the formaldehyde ubiquitous? No, the formaldehyde, the formaldehyde is reveal, uh, crossing reveals a local result, nothing related to anything macroscopic on the scale that you mentioned, only uh, at the level of individual protein-protein contact. So uh, those experiments, of course, done without squashing, but it wouldn't matter. The, the range of the interaction of the polyteens is exactly the same as the range in diploid cells or in embryonic tissue. Uh, so I showed you that the TADs are typically in the order of a megabase in size, and that will be true throughout. You talked about this earlier. Can one be sure that there's no fat body contaminated in the polyteen separation? Well, in the, the first place, uh, the, I, I, of course, I'm, I absolutely don't know 
the answer to that question. All I can tell you is that uh, when salivary glands are dissected, they give this result, and it is equivalent to what is found with KC cells of Drosophila and equivalent to what is found with embryonic tissue of Drosophila. That's all I can tell you. Now one can, of course, put a ruler to the picture in the light microscope of a polythene chromosome. And with knowledge of the DNA coordinates from the deep sequencing, from the high C analysis, uh, state rather precisely uh, what is the degree of compaction of the DNA along the length of the chromosome. And for this purpose, we actually took measurements that were made long ago by John Sadat. And uh, they reveal what is shown here that in between the bands, the region uh, referred to as interbands, uh, the packing ratio defined as the length of the DNA uh, contained in that region divided by the observed or measured length of the fiber, packing ratio is between 5 and 10. And it just happens that uh, by now, what, 40 some odd years ago when I uh, put forward the idea of uh, the nucleosome I could calculate from what I surmised to be the DNA content of a nucleosome and the approximate diameter of a particle, calculated a ratio of 6.8. Uh, so without any doubt, what we have in interbands are open chains, extended chromatin fibers. We know from the sequence analysis they came in about 5% of the total DNA and within the interbands reside, for the most part, the regulatory sequences and promoters of Drosophila genes, uh, those that undergo transcription. Uh, Drosophila cyto cytologists and geneticists identify two types of bands. They call gray and black. Um, and again, by such measurements, we know that the gray bands have an intermediate packing ratio between the interbands and black bands. They represent such fibers condensed some two to tenfold. They contain about a quarter of all the DNA, and for the most part, the bodies of transcriptionally active genes. And finally, the black bands contain such fibers now condensed 20 to 30 fold, the majority of the DNA, and, all, and, in, and in every case, genes that are not transcribed. So this gives some color to the picture that I showed you before. Um, now we have a better idea of what is the organization of the chromosomal material um, within the interphase nucleus, and in particular, what is the structure of a gene uh, undergoing transcription. So I, uh, that is the conclusion of what I have to say, and I know time is short, and everybody wants to hear what Sid will comment at the end. Um, I only wanted to reiterate what I said at the beginning uh, and to emphasize uh, something which I think is often forgotten, uh, namely uh, the insights that Sid derived and everything that I've told you uh, comes not from studies of human cells, <laughs> but, but what we call model organisms. Uh, and I think that uh, there's still much to be learned from work on these lines, that the best is yet to come. Uh, congratulations, Sid, and thank you all. Roger, a question that is coming up all the time. <coughs> is a very differentiated cell versus a non-differentiated cell? and if you can actually detect any differences there. Uh, uh, in, in these experiments, we have not attempted to detect such a difference. Uh, but let me add that uh, it may be uh, helpful to mention polythene chromosomes, of course, lack one uh, feature that Mark mentioned and that is common in very many differentiated tissues. It would be an important property of what uh, Tom and Yannis alluded to before. Uh, the uh, looping of chromosomal material to bring enhancers at some distance in proximity to promoters. Of course, that's not possible in a polythene chromosome because you have a thousand copies lined up and they are comparatively rigid. And indeed, one can show that, for example, in the, uh, uh, some of the important uh, loci that exhibit this, I don't know, in Canopedia or others where this happens, uh, those uh, features are detectable by this high C analysis in cells of an appropriate origin, the differentiated cells where it occurs, and not in the polythene chromosomes. So what we look at in the polythene case is the, if you were, the basic level of chromosomal organization of 
um, interphase nuclei in general. There are additional features that may be superimposed in differentiated tissue. Indeed. I'd be glad to mention that. I just was worried about uh, the time. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a word. In fact, in fact, I could probably go back to it very quickly if, but if I can get, recover this. But if not, I'll just say it in a word. Um, uh, I think it's uh, best not to try. Uh, so it had been suggested by many that the uh, mechanism of formation of a nucleosome-free region depended on the abundance of AT-rich DNA. Mark alluded to that point. And it was thought that uh, it is a passive mechanism, that it is because of what had long been known that AT-rich DNA in particular, poly-DA, poly-DT is actually refractory to the formation of a nucleosome. It is sufficiently rigid, it won't bend around the histone octomer to form a nucleosome. Uh, we tested that idea in a straightforward way. We discovered we could form nucleosomes. They had, the histone octomer had a comparable affinity for nucleosome-free regions from yeast as for DNA derived from the bodies of genes. Uh, we went on to show that if we assemble a nucleosome on DNA from a nucleosome-free region um, and side by side, DNA coming from, for example, an open reading frame, that the risk remodeling complex would remove the nucleosome at least an order of magnitude more rapidly uh, from the NFR. And then finally, we could show that if we start with uh, a nucleosome assembled on DNA that is of uh, a typical origin and has no uh, significant oligo-DA, oligo-DT stretches, for example, uh, risk would remove a nucleosome only very slowly. If we insert simply a seven residue stretch of oligo-DA, oligo-DT, then the nucleosome is rapidly removed. So indeed, as people have suggested, uh, the presence of AT-rich sequences plays a role, but not through a passive, rather an active mechanism. Uh, it's something which is controlled, it's ATP-dependent, and it involves the function of the risk chromatin remodeling complex. 